Good afternoon and welcome to New America. My name is Lauren Ellen McCann and I'm a Civic Innovation Fellow at the Open Technology Institute here at New America. New America is a nonpartisan think tank and civic enterprise dedicated to the renewal of American politics, prosperity, and purpose in the digital age. And today, in a sense, we're going to be talking about what it means to prosper in America. Trayvon Martin in 2012, Michael Brown in August 2014, Eric Garner in July, Tamir Rice, 12 years old, February 2015. And besides these names, countless others, unarmed people of color, men and women who have been killed by the police. On and off for months now since Mr. Brown's death in Ferguson, people around the country and around the world have organized everything from enormous marches and protests to small group meetups and potlucks to respond to these losses and to evaluate how to wield power, how to wield a moment where explicit conversations about power and about race have finally started to slip into the living rooms of the privileged. Should the focus stay on the social message, that hashtag Black Lives Matter? Or should the strategy be, to paraphrase Reverend Jesse Jackson, to move from demonstrations to legislation and litigation? Here on the 50th anniversary of the Selma marches, I ask you, why do we have to choose? And what does it mean to choose? Thanks to the hashtag activism of these past several months, in December, President Obama appointed a task force on 21st century policing to identify concrete, innovative, and necessary changes and strategies to rebuild public trust, reduce crime, and rebuild the relationship between our police forces and the communities they serve. Just two weeks ago, on March 2nd, these recommendations were released. The 120-page document calls not for body cams, but for human-centered approaches, like better first aid and conflict negotiation training. But with most policing done at the local, not the federal level, what does this report have to do with reality? Are the ideas possible, practical, the right ones? Do they advance both policy ends and social needs? Do they share the responsibility for change, or do they put undue pressure on local communities? These are the questions we're going to be examining today with our amazing panel during this second event in the New America and Howard University Collaborative Series for Moment to Movement, Conversations on Race in America. We are joined here by Dr. Greg Carr, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. Sergeant Delroy Burton, Chairman of the DC Police Union, Board Member of the DC Police Officer Standards and Training Board, and Sergeant with the DC Metro Police Department. Tanya Clayhouse, Director of Public Policy at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And our moderator, Alex Altman, National Correspondent for Time. A couple of quick housekeeping things before we get started. Today's event is being live streamed. Those are the tiny little robots moving around the room. And a recording of the panel will be available on New America website after the event. I think I made that sound more terrifying than it is. <laughs> they are just there, not moving very far. Uh, and for those of you who are both in the room and watching us online, we'd like to encourage you to continue the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Moment2Movement, and that is the number two. So give a round for our guests. Um, well, thank you for that generous introduction. I'm Alex Altman. I'm a reporter for Time. Um, and today, my job is essentially to uh, facilitate the discussion, but otherwise keep out of the way of our excellent panel here. Um, and I hope you will all uh, jump in uh, in response to each other's points um, and just sort of feel free to have a, a free ranging conversation. But um, maybe we'll, Tanya will kick it off with you. Um, and I think I will just open with a, a very general question um, about what you made of the recommendations contained uh, in the Obama Policing Task Force. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, let me just say um, it, I, I appreciate the conversation today. Uh, it is, in fact, I just uh, got back from a hearing in which we were testifying with the Inter-America Commission on Human Rights specifically about Ferguson and about uh, race in the criminal justice system. So this is uh, a, a topic that is relevant on a domestic and international level. Um, and I think that it is, th the president's task force on 21st century policing 
is, was a terrific opportunity to really highlight and bring forth uh, you know, a lot of the issues that I think we've been talking about and try to bring forth some recommendations that I think all of us feel are necessary. Um, the Lawyers Committee has been engaged on race issues and basically in, 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 in a kind of this form of dealing with civil rights issues for over 50 years. I mean, we were created and founded by former uh, President John F. Kennedy in order to essentially eliminate racial discrimination. So we haven't done that yet. Um, we are uh, continuing to work upon that goal. And one of those, one of, in, in that effort, obviously we've been engaged in dealing with these issues of race and the racial disparities within the criminal justice system. In doing so, we, after the killing of Michael Brown and the tragedy there, and because of the, so, the, the continued highlighting of, of killings of unarmed African Americans, not only just youth, but African Americans broadly, men and women, which I want to make sure that we emphasize, we brought together a coalition of organizations, national, state, local uh, organizations, grassroots, that would try to bring forth some recommendations. And we, in fact, you know, if you're here today, we have those recommendations out there. It's called our Unified Statement for Unified Action. And this had a 14-point strategy for long-term change. One of those recommendations includes the creation of a type of oversight committee, um, something that would, uh, a task force that would provide some recommendations for long-term change. And so in that effort, and you know, we were very pleased to see the president create this, this task force. And so I think that it is a step. It is the beginning. Uh, we, have seen, we are seeing just the tip of the iceberg of what needs to be done. The task force ha had a lot of great recommendations, particularly, I think, bringing, you know, highlighting the fact that we are talking about the entire criminal justice system, that this is just not simply about what happened in Ferguson, that this is really indicative of what's happening on a national level, um, on all levels, and that we've got to look at this as a major disruptive force that needs to be brought in terms of dealing with the implicit bias that exists, particularly within not only in policing, but I think generally in the criminal justice. And so therefore, naturally, if you're talking about implicit bias in the criminal justice system, it's going to affect all areas because it's the person, it's the, it's the structure that we're dealing with. And so I think that was particularly informative of the, the task force recommendations. There's a lot more that apparently that, you know, that I think that we can get into more, but I will say that I think it was, you know, in, in addition to highlighting the implicit bias, to also acknowledging that we need to deal with the culture um, of how it is that we're policing in America today to, so that it's not obvious, you know, we talk about protect and serve, but unfortunately there are those within, um, you know, there are those that are, 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 are it, it's a different type of mentality, particularly if you're not engaged with your community and you don't know who it is you're working with on a daily basis. So instead of looking at protecting and serving, it's a culture of, looking at as a threat or trying to make sure you're maintaining order and not so much as protecting and serving that community. And then thirdly, I want to emphasize that I think it was very important uh, to talk about you know, how it is that we need to deal with the information gathering, to get all that information, that transparency, uh, so that we actually know what's happening. Uh, because right now we just don't have that information. So there's a lot of great recommendations. There's some that are missing, uh, we can talk about later, but I think that it was a great start, I'll say, and I think there's a lot more to be done. Well, <clears throat> as, a, as a policeman, you know, I hear those things all the time. It, th but this is what I know, is that this is a resource problem in part, as you talk about the information gathering piece. As most of you are aware, police departments in the United States, and there are thousands of them, about 18,000, most of them are 50 police officers and smaller. So the, the kind of recommendations that are contained in the, in the task force's uh, document, most of those agencies are not going to be able to do. They simply don't have the resources to do it. So if the, if the federal government, and as we also know, because of the separation of powers between states and the federal government, and then as you go deeper into the breakup of the state with the county, and the local and municipal government, people will, or those, those particular government entities aren't always in concert, and they push back against interference. You know, I think the state of New Jersey comes to mind with just the number of municipal governments that are in that state. 
In terms of the recommendations themselves, um, one of the things that I thought the task force, and it's a decent document, but I thought they rushed and that they didn't deal with it very well. They, they use the phrase that uh, police agencies, and then they say law enforcement, and then they go back to the criminal justice system. They kind of intermingle the two. I, don't, I didn't like that. But one of the recommendations was that uh, police departments and law enforcement need to go back and acknowledge past misconduct or racial misconduct. And I, and I think that's putting the blame on, on the police for what is essentially a national problem for us. You know, racism has been with America since America's founding. Racism was systemic. It was uh, protected by, le by legislation. It was, uh, you couldn't get good, you couldn't get service. You couldn't get equal protection under the law as the Constitution guarantees. So to go back and put it on policing to correct what has essentially been a problem with the United States since its founding, I think they missed the opportunity to say, you know what, as a nation, in every aspect of government, we failed to protect the rights of the minority, even though that's our ideal. And, and so we, the, the United States government, state governments, county governments, and muni municipalities need to acknowledge their wrongdoing. So as a whole, we all need to acknowledge the wrongdoing. The other part, it, it talks about uh, procedural justice and being able to communicate with the community you serve and interact in a different way with the community that we serve. And I don't necessarily disagree with that, but we t you talked about uh, implicit bias. Well, bias is a two-way street. You know, one of the things, if you look at the most recent shooting in Los Angeles uh, on the Skid Row uh, shooting, we talk about diversity. Some people think, well, if it's a black police officer involved, you'll get a different response in the community. Not necessarily. The, the, the trust issue that they talk about in regaining is a problem, again, going back to the founding of the country. So if for hundreds of years uh, you were slaves, and then after the Emancipation Proclamation you were free for a little while, then uh, uh, domestic terrorism kicked in with the Ku Klux Klan, Jim Crow, all of that. So the black community's perception of government, p police in particular, is informed by that experience. So in order for, for the black community to trust the outcome, they have to view it through a different lens. We can't, if we always view it through that lens, we will never trust the police to do anything because we'll just say, here they go again. Is it a good start? I think it's a decent start. I think a part of the problem, though, is people can't be honest or afraid, they are afraid to be honest about how they feel about race. Um, you know, one of the things that we need facts and we need to look at facts objectively. In, uh, one of the things the, in, during the introduction that I always take exception to is that Trayvon Martin was killed by a policeman. He was not. Had the police gotten on the scene before uh, uh, Zimmerman, I believe Trayvon Martin would be alive. So yes, Trayvon Martin's name helped to, be, to, to bring the conversation about race, but please don't mix that in with the other Austin involved shootings. Uh, the Austin involved shooting in Ferguson investigated by the federal government, investigated at the local level. That police also was cleared. I understand the community's angst about that stuff, but we have to be very, very careful. And I believe conversations like these is what are, are, that need to take place is the form in which we will get those ideas out. We, you know, one of the things I said when I was at Brookings is that I've seen a lot of demagoguery on both sides. And if we do that and talk past one another and never listen to the other person's perspective, we'll be back here in about a year or two when the next incident happens. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'm. I'm First of all, thanks uh, for New American for inviting us, and uh, I'm glad to be part of this conversation. And um, I'm certainly glad that uh, Sergeant Burton said what needed to be said, so I don't have to say it. I think that report missed another opportunity. I think when historians look back at the Obama administration, uh, W. Du Bois wrote something in 1897, 1896, you know, first, his first book, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States. He said, until this country deals with the fundamental flaws that it were basically baked into the polity, it will continue to have to revisit those flaws. Nobody would have looked on with more horror at the Civil War than the Founding Fathers. <coughs> but in fact, it was inevitable. Because structurally, this is, you know, this is the challenge that we have. I think, unfortunately, um, the Obama administration has missed again because it won't be honest. And uh, that's not to single out the president. He's just the current president. There hasn't been much honesty. In fact, the report mentions a 1967 attempt to begin to address these kind of things. So, so I, I appreciate that, Sergeant Burton, for you saying that. Um, certainly, George Zimmerman wasn't the police. 
but he was in fact, um, uh, in his mind anyway, law enforcement, meaning what? There's law and order and I'm out here to help try to enforce it. Uh, a generation ago it was Bernard Getz. Uh, now it's uh, George Zimmerman. But simply put, you have the idea that black folks, anti-citizens, beginning with black folks and then others, have to be policed, have to be surveilled. Um, you know, the United States of America is a concept. Of those um, 18,000 or so police jurisdictions, um, as you say, most of them 50 uh, police are under, but roughly half of them are 10 people or less. And I don't know that necessarily the police in Tallulah, Louisiana look like the police in Los Angeles, California. I think there are different relationships based on who the people are, what the culture is of the space, and how that culture emerges. And I think what we see in that report is a very, um, a very clear evasion of the fundamental problem, we ha one of the fundamental problems we have in this country, which is we don't have a country as a concept. We have people of African descent who, you're absolutely right, learn to respect the law for its ability to punish, not for any relationship to justice. And we have uh, a civil war that emerged with, the civil, uh, with civil War amendments, 13, 14, and 15, and the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which uh, may have, may still be uh, the most forceful federal statute that's ever been put on the books. It hadn't been used a whole lot. Uh, but then you have to have a second reconstruction 100 years later. We're in this anniversary of 50th. But, you know, black lives matter. But in this country, black death matters more. Civil Rights Act of 1964 comes after the Birmingham movement, the killings in Birmingham, comes after a season of blood. The Voting Rights Act comes after uh, Bloody Sunday in Selma. And the last of those three, 1968, the Civil Rights Act of 1968, comes after the assassination of Martin Luther King. It seems that in this country, the only thing that moves this country to act, and that's at a federal level, is the sacrifice of black folks. And, you know, quite frankly, kind of sum it up and we get into conversation, I think, um, what the report re really reveals is the powerlessness of the federal government to do anything, really, that can intervene in the lives of black folks. Because the first recommendation they say is to set up a permanent panel. Black folks don't need a permanent panel in the middle of the night when the police have pulled you over. They needed somebody to intervene on their behalf. And I suspect that depending on where they are in this country, what their relationship is with their local police officers, if it's a small town in Alabama where the cops are black and they're black, or the cops are white and they're black, but they know those police differently, maybe it turns out differently than New York City or Philadelphia. Maybe it doesn't. But the point is that we're trying to address a structural problem. And as the report says, Organizational culture trumps policy every time, but we're talking about the organizational culture of the state itself, and that's the thing that is missing from that report. Well, so is it an exercise in futility then? Is there anything um, uh, that it can sort of spur uh, local police departments or the federal government to do as a result? Well, I think the it's going to spur action. You, you will, you've seen some activity already. I think one of the things that was troubling about Ferguson on a personal level for me, I've heard people try to compare Selma in 1965 to what's going on in Ferguson. Now I think it's a false comparison because in 1965, black people were trying to get access to the political system. In Ferguson, they were 67%, if I'm, uh, I, I might be incorrect about the percentage of the population. They should have controlled politically what was going on in Ferguson. And, and that's a demonstration of what's going on in America in general. There's political apathy. And, and now, unfortunately, it took uh, a death to spur interest in the political process. Where the power is, is in the political process. And so those communities that want to have uh, good relationships with the police, they need to you exercise their political power to be able to shape who makes the decisions about who's in charge of the police department, what they want the police department to do. The, the other thing is that a lot of the focus in the report is in what policing needs to do. And, and change. And policing has evolved significantly in the United States over the last 50 years. I think even though there's a lot of improvement that still can be made, uh, it's probably never been better than it is right now in terms of the level of training, uh, the quality of the, the people that we're hiring. That doesn't mean it cannot improve, but changes need to happen on the other side too. It's not just police officers that need it to change because police officers are out of the community. We come from within the community. So 
When we talk about implicit bias, there's implicit bias in every community and there's bias against police officers, so it's a two-way street. And we, as a country, need to deal with the fact that every ill that we can point a finger at at a police officer, there are three fingers pointing back at you to tell you that you, as the individual citizen, need to deal with your implicit bias and, and the way you view things. We can become cynical as police officers. I, this is an example I use all the time. We deal with bad, when you deal with juveniles, you tend to think, God, these young kids in this generation are bad. The reality is, I'm just dealing with the bad kids. Most kids are good. When I, when I work in bad communities, most we're high crime communities, high drug and, 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 and low employment. Most of the people in those communities are good. I continue to deal with the same 10, 5% of the population that's causing problems all the time. So I could become cynical and think, well, you know, this whole population is bad. No, they're not. They're just in a bad circumstance. And that's not something the police can affect. Un unfortunately, a lot of these issues get pushed down to, to a guy who we ask, or a girl who we ask to go out and enforce the law. And these are social problems that are, require other interventions other than law enforcement. So I, I don't disagree that this is a larger problem. That's actually what I was emphasizing, that when I, talked, when I spoke about the, the reports highlighting of the implicit bias that exists in the criminal justice system, I characterize that as you know, I, I tried to put that in context in saying that you know, we're talking about implicit bias in criminal justice, which incorporates when we're talking about policing as well. It is a function of how it is that we are dealing with race in this country. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that we don't need to deal with the result and the consequences that exist within the police culture. So I, while I agree that we have to deal with the bias on all ends. We can't deny that we, can't, we, we, we have to deal with it with what we see right now. So, you know, I, I, I appreciate the, the need to make sure that we are not, we are not trying to, um, um, uh, that we are not uh, characterizing all police as, as hostile and as, as that they are not doing their job. And I, in fact, I think that it's furthest from the truth in fact, I think what we're, trying to, what we're trying to highlight is to say that this is a function, what we're seeing right now, what is happening, the, the highlighting of a lot of these tragic killings is a function of what we're dealing with in the larger society, but we've got to deal with it. Um, and so we've got to deal with the training. We've got to deal with how it is that um, people are being perceived in their communities. And yes, even though we're talking about that there is a, 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 a different sensitivity when it comes to people of color, particularly African American, when you're talking about police, you're right, it's the result of the history that has existed in this country, the racism, the structural institutional racism that we've had, the oppression that has developed throughout the years, that's a natural inclination. If you've got an oppressed people, you're, taught, you're going to be dealing, you're, you're going to have a certain bias against those structures that have been oppressing you for years. That being said, we are a structure of people. We're people, so we're individuals. So each of us has to deal with our individual bias. And so that means that it's not just, we gotta deal with the bias of not only the communities, but the biases that individuals within the policing force also have that then result in some of the problems that we're talking about. So I think, so I, I don't disagree actually with a lot of what you're saying, but I don't want to, I don't want to, um, us to ignore the fact that we are dealing with individuals that have biases on all ends, and that we've got to actually incorporate trainings, we've got to deal with how it is that we are training our people that we know have biases that may have, um, that because they're always seeing that few, that percentage of bad actors, that therefore they're categorizing um, the en entire community in this bad light, that's a bias still that we've got to deal with. And I think that that is something that is creating such a structure right now, we have this continual, um, we, we have such a, a vast um, you know, distrust, unfortunately, of right now of many communities of color against police because they feel that there is this stereotype that is being perpetuated within the entire culture. So um, I, I think there's a lot of agreement here, but I think that we've got to make sure that we're not um, ignoring the reality that we've got to deal individually. We can't just simply say that it's not it's not this, it's not that, it's, it's all together that we have to deal with. That's right, That's right. And, and, and as you say, it's structural. I, 
I wouldn't single out the police, except that in that case, and I was glad to see that Jennifer Eberhardt testified the, first, the second week of January, who's done some work on this question of implicit bias. It's one thing to have implicit bias when you don't have a gun or the option to use a gun or a taser. And when you look at the recommendations and they talk about, you know, use of non-lethal non ways to subdue folks, I'm thinking, you know, in that split second, what have you been socialized to believe about that person? And the decision you make could end up with this person being dead. Now, sure, maybe you'll go to jail, maybe you won't, as we know, uh, particularly with uh, the, the report in Ferguson that was issued by the Justice Department. In Civil Rights Act 1964, the intent standard is so high that no policeman is going to jail. Or very few police will be going to jail for exercising uh, their judgment in a split second. And, you know, one of the questions I might ask is, what exactly did the police do wrong? Or do the police do wrong in a state polity where that is their function? I mean, even the language of the report, uh, police should be uh, should reorient themselves around this notion of being guardians. Guardians? The police are not soldiers. Of course they're soldiers. If you're looking at yourself as protecting something from something else. Are and you talking about the police, the President's Task Force report or the DOJ's report? Right? I'm talking about the President's Task Force okay. at this point. Yes, okay. so I'm just, I was mentioning the, 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 the DOJ's uh, report mm -hmm. because, you know, there's an attempt to reform, but ultimately reform is not what we need. We need a paradigm shift in how we're having this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, the, the guardian versus the soldier analogy, I, I hear that one all the time in the quote unquote militarization of, of policing. Militarization had nothing to do with Ferguson. Um, now, a lot of people didn't like the equipment they used after the rioting started, but the militarization didn't cause the riot. Uh, a quote unquote militarization. I think when we, I think we, we uh, run the risk of alienating further the, uh, the police officers and the community when we start describing them as soldiers, as occupiers. Because in a community that is a high crime community that need police services the most, now, you take a look at this, this, this false choice. If I pull back on the, on, on the amount of policing I'm doing in that community, then I'm not providing good service. If I put a lot of resources in that community, then I'm over-policing. I'm not sure where the balance so is. When you say service, what do you mean? I mean, the number of officers in there, they're trying to keep the shootings down, the robberies, whatever. Exactly. So there's exactly. a difference, though, between providing the service and, harass and harassment, which I think a lot of people don't necessarily see the distinction. For example, what happened in, you know, after the killing of, um, um, of Eric Garner and a lot of the unrest that erupted, uh, in New York, you know, you had the police unions there who essentially declared, well, you know what, we're going to pull back and we're not going to police. We didn't have an interruption of an additional police, you know, additional crime and criminal activity that came as a result of them pulling back. So I think that I hear what you're saying, but I think that there has got to be an understanding of exactly what the question is, what do you mean by but additional policing versus just having and it, you know, versus having These are, the presence. These are political decisions. And unfortunately, at the end of that political decision, you see the police. And right. the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the administration in New York that, uh, and, and I'm not giving an opinion one way or the other, but in terms of the, the stop and frisk policy that they had, that, that was not a policy that was instituted by the, the, the police department. That was something that was political. You, the end result was you saw the police mm -hmm. more aggressively enforcing every every minor rule. Well, that's what the political establishment wanted. Okay, so the police then bear the brunt of going out here, interacting with people every day, particularly in places where they need to be the most because of the high levels of crime or whatever the disorder issue is that needs to be dealt with. And as the uh, one thing that's correct in the report is that the enforcement then, people chafe at the enforcement even though you're, you're knocking down certain types of crime, people feel like they're being harassed. And no police officer goes out with the intent of going out and harassing someone. And, and contrary to popular belief, we get punished for things in policing, well, in the MPD. My, all of my experiences with the Metropolitan Police Department, which is one of the five largest police departments in the United States. So all the policies and the things they talk about in the report, we already have and we already do. Mm -hmm. For example, it talks about language and how language can be inflammatory and take a, a situation from you and I having a discussion to being inflammatory, depending on what I say. Right. Well, we, we teach something called verbal judo, and it's, it's standard. 
when I interact with you, for example, on a traffic stop, the first thing I'll do is introduce myself, and I will tell you. That's not what happened to me. And, I was and, stopped and, by MPD. White police officer to stop me. But that's absolutely what, but that's did not engage. But that's what's supposed to happen. Well, that's and, right. That's very, and here's the difference between what's supposed and to here, happen and what but, but here's the part that, that most people never see, is that you get disciplined for things in, in my profession that the average person would never get disciplined. If I curse at you, mm -hmm. I get disciplined for that. If, How about if you say, you got somebody to pick you up because you're going to jail tonight before you ever ask for license or registration. And that's my experience, brother. I can't say anything. I, exactly. I, I, you can't. It's I, nothing. I, you, I, 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 can't, I can't ask you that question that's and you right. can't give me that answer. That's right. Answer that that's the only answer because, you can give. Because if that is what happened, I, mm -hmm. I, I, if, let me take you at your word and say that what's ha that's what happened. Okay. That would be an inappropriate interaction. So you would agree? I would, that interaction, because it, it's, it, it tends to escalate the situation sure. unnecessarily. And, and, as, and as a union uh, man, and, I, and I, you know, my father, I mean, we, we union family. Right. So I respect that. You have to intervene on behalf of that police officer before he gets disciplined, or if he's going to be disciplined, if for no other reason, then you have to protect his rights. Absolutely, right? and that's, yeah. the, that's the union's job, exactly. is to protect the due so process I'm rights. Not, not, not to stop someone from Absolutely. being disciplined or Absolutely. to prevent management from exercising their responsibilities to run the, the union. Absolutely. Our job is to protect the due process rights because when you become a police officer, you don't lose Absolutely. your due process rights. Absolutely. And a lot of times when police officers are accused of misconduct, Everybody wants to, or not everyone, some, no, people, no, no. some sure. people want to lop their heads off right away. He's sure. a copy, he shouldn't have done that. Sure. Well, let the process work. And, you know, we fire in our agency, and I can't speak to other agencies, <laughs> okay? We fire a lot of people. Sure. Um, and we discipline a lot of people in 30, 45. The, the, the most severe penalty, other than termination that I just saw, was a 70-day suspension without pay. So mm -hmm. they, they are very harsh with us for things that, uh, if you and I are neighbors, and let's say your dog takes a, you know, used the bathroom on my lawn, and we get into a heated argument about it, and I just berate you, and you call the police department, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. Because we can be disciplined for our on-duty related conduct and our off-duty related and, conduct. And, and I think that what is instructive here is that there's a reason that you're held to a higher standard. Yes. Because you have that authority. You have that Super, you know, that is something that is different from when you're talking about simply a colleague having a very animated conversation at work. If you're at a, if you, so if you're talking about two colleagues who are not, um, who are at the same level, no, there's no super, supervisory authority over one or the other, then you're not going to have the same type of interaction or same type of, I think, um, uh, control over different individuals as you would someone who actually has an authority. So you're talking about a typical, I think, you know, employment, uh, employment interaction. Um, and I think that that's, it's necessary to have a higher standard for police. If you're carrying a gun and you actually have an ability to enact some type of uh, authority and control over an individual, then you would need to have that higher standard. And I don't have a problem with that. What I think um, we need to deal with is that there does become, there's a line that unfortunately gets crossed too many times. And because people, you know, for example, you talked about your interactions with uh, police officers, some police officers, you know, I've had my own. I mean, I, we all have had differing, varying accounts. And, you know, and, and let's just put this to the side. I have a, my father-in-law, my, excuse my, father, my stepfather, is a sheriff, okay? So let's just be clear. I don't have a, you know, a negative reaction automatically, but I will say that I have been pulled over simply because I was driving a sports car. I had a cap on, and I'm sure I did not look like I was a young, you know, female, but for some reason I was pulled over in the middle of the night, and I'm like, and when I jumped out with my University of Michigan shirt on, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, okay, so I'm, you know, sorry, oh, you're just, you're fine. And he's like, you just had, you know, we, we just saw you pull out with, you know, so lights on or something like that. I was like, I just came out of the gas station. Gee, I, I, I was well, about. I can't, I can't no, speak no. to the stop, but I will. I will give you some advice about jumping out of the car. That that is. No, no, no I didn't jump out immediately. <laughs> I, I would never have done that. I'm because, a little bit more. Because that. Because When we talk you, about yes. reaction, police officers are almost always reacting to what somebody else does. We're always behind the eight ball. So if you jump out of the car and the police officer reacts, I, I know what I would have done. If you, because it happened to me once. I don't, I don't know what your intentions are, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you've done. So I have to react defensively right. at that point. Wow. 
So right, but I don't want yes, to derail yes, the conversation on a, that because that. Yeah, but I do want to. I do want to yeah, say this for the a, you know that the point is the point that I was getting to is that I think that you've got to there there is a reason that we do have a higher standard uh, for our police officers just like we have a higher standard for anybody who has that that authority or control over another individual especially if you can automatically based upon your one-on-one -on -one interaction you can throw somebody in jail and then you've got to prove after the fact that you were not in the wrong so that's why a lot of you know the recommendations that are with getting back to the task force mm -hmm. <laughs> that we are that, that there are things in there that call for a better tech use of technology I appreciate those um, agencies that are utilizing you know, uh, body-worn cameras or dash cameras or other technology that provides that transparency and so that all are protected, that it's not simply the individual but it's also the police officer so you, can, so you can have that due process. And if anything, I would look forward to actually being able to hold up those agencies that have model practices. So what you're talking about, I would love to be able to get my hands on certain information to be able to say, you know what, this is what we're looking for. Sure. You know, this is the type of thing, this is the type of engagement that we like to actually promote. Furthermore, I'd actually ask you, if you talk, uh, you know, if we're in, trying to change this entire culture, don't you think it's also important to make sure that we have this community relationship so that, um, so if we're either through a community oversight or some type of a, if, required engagement with the community so that there is the, so that so you can uh, um, uh, eliminate those types of that bias and those types of barriers that many have we, uh, against we want, police we, forces. we would love to do that here's the mm -hmm. question though for all police communities not just here in washington dc how do you bridge that high level of distrust particularly in the black community based on historical well, conduct interesting. in the report yeah. for example um, some very good testimony, good oral testimony. I haven't read the transcripts of everything. I fought, caught a few of them on C-SPAN, but I saw Charles Ogletree was there, my friend Cheryl, uh, Cheryl and I for the, uh, the uh, Legal Defense Plan. I didn't see one historian, however. Uh, even in the recommendations, the six pillars, the recommendation on education, particularly providing more education for police officers, and I'm, uh, who could be against loan forgiveness for police officers to continue their education? I'm for that. I mean, absolutely, keep going. I still didn't see anything specific to deal with the question of history in this country. Everything was oriented around bias. Everything was oriented around, and that's almost like colorblind constitutionalism. Well, discrimination is discrimination. You discriminate against me, I discriminate against you. No, 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 this is not a zero-sum game. There's historical context for this. They ducked the issue. Absolutely I mean, if, if ducked it. They, Completely avoided the and issue. And what they said about it, I thought, you know, they did the whole report a disservice because the key to all of this is the historical context. Okay. It's, it's not simply police officers are out here uh, going out here to brutalize the, the citizens that we swear to protect. I'm one of those citizens. You know, sure. my wife and my children That's can't right. drive down the street to go conduct any business if the police officers where I live don't do their no. work. And, so, di and didn't address race within the culture of policing. I mean, it's, it, it, it is very disappointing on any number of levels. So, I, you know, let me, and I'm sure you probably have some other questions you want to uh, ask us, got, but... Um, <laughs> going, this is great. Yeah. I think that it is... Um, we, we need to recognize also the context in which we were dealing with this, this task force. Let's just be please, honest. Yeah. Please. This task force was pulled together within probably two weeks. And they had approximately six weeks right. to hear testimony across the country and develop recommendations and get a report out to the president on March, was it 2nd? Mm -hmm. that, um, and it was just kind of a whirlwind tour that they conducted. There is no way that they possibly could have gotten to everything that needed to be gotten to within this report. So to be fair, well, okay, well, to be fair, I just want to say that for the record. I don't think that there's any way they could have gotten to that. And to also to be fair, I think that they had a, they had a mandate. There was an executive order that the president gave. Yes. All right, that executive order didn't say to address the entire culture of history of racism in this country. It but didn't. It, but it didn't say not to. It didn't say not to. And when you read the to. preamble, it, it's alluded to, which means they were aware of it. I, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I, I'm just saying that I think that we need to take it upon ourselves to force that conversation. Absolutely. And that Absolutely. you're right. This administration is not going to get to everything that we need it to get to. It hasn't yet. And it's not going to, I don't think any administration 
will deal with the, the this, these issues of race unless we force them to. That's right. Um, and so I'm glad we're having the conversation, but I don't think that we can. Um, I think that we need to take from what we take what we can from this report and then push it further. Absolutely. Because I just I, I don't think that there was really um, an opportunity to get to everything that needed to be get to, to gotten to. But I'm not my words are all <laughs> off. But no, 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 but I do but, but, agree that the history, the structure of racism in this country is that what has created this 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 the, this problem that we have this uh, you know endemic in our society, particularly not only in policing but criminal justice, right. in, in our economy. Right. And so much that we have right now. That's right. Well, what what sorts of tools? And I, I I agree with what you said. Is that you know we can't expect sort of a uh, a slapdash report, and that's not in sort of insulting the report, but a report compiled in such a short frame of time that tackles such uh, weighty and deeply ingrained issues to obviously fix everything, but um, or anything at all really. Um, but what tools does the federal government have? Um, to try to encourage or incentivize uh, a rebuilding yeah. of trust between police and communities, you know, no. be it through legislation a, a or through grants. Not a rebuilding of trust, because there was it, never any trust. That's probably fair. <laughs> well, yeah, building um, of trust. Yeah. It, but I think it requires, like I said earlier, it, it requires action on the part of the community, it requires action on the part of the police. What the federal government has, resources. What a lot of these small agencies don't have it. They don't have the same level of training that we receive and those communities simply can't afford to pay for it. I mean, in times of crisis, you know, we were just talking about this, we have a staffing crisis coming up. We have 1,100 officers that can leave in the next two years mm -hmm. uh, because we hired 1,500 people in a two year span. Mm -hmm. And they didn't plan for this and now we can't hire as fast as we're losing people. This was during the this Clinton was, administration? No, this was uh, in 1989, 19, yeah, okay. 20, about 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. So now we have this problem and now we need to replace people at a very, very fast clip. And doing it at a fast clip is never good for policing. So, you know, the federal government has resources. Unfortunately, politically and structurally, we can't have a national um, police force. It will never, it will never pass political muster. But one of the things, one of the recommendations in there is to set standards, and with the, with the help of the federal government to fund uh, of their funding ab ability, we can train all police officers in a very, very similar standard. I know in, in state police agencies, large city and county police agencies, that level of training and funding is already there. But the, 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 I think the, the problem manifests itself in all policing in terms of uh, the, the things we've been discussing. But it really, really gets bad the smaller the agency gets. And I, I agree with that completely. I think one of the recommendations that we provided, not only in the Unified Statement, but the Lawyers Committee also provided testimony at the, for the task force is to incentivize the grants that are going to the uh, law enforcement agencies so that you do not, to, you can have some type of standard, uh, um, a uniform standard of uh, training, of, of resource allocation, that you can have uniform standards in place. And I think that that is something that I think can be done. The federal government is very adept at doing that. They are Race very to the top. Ex exactly. Yep. <laughs> Race to the top and, and many other ways. And so and, and this can be done even through resource allocation of, um, of, of, of um, you know, of all the various resources, all types of resources that police agencies are getting. But, but how does that work? I mean, if you don't have sort of a national oversight board um, that is in charge of, in charge of making decisions, but measuring how well different uh, departments are performing. How, how do they sort of... That's difficult because I think to create metrics, obviously it wouldn't right. be one size fits all. Right. But, um, you know, Ralph Bunch said something a half century ago that still rings true to me today. The Negro, uh, at the time, of course, saying Negro, the African American is a special ward of the federal government. Meaning that the question of oversight Federal oversight is really what has triggered any progress in this country. So if you're trying to have oversight of something like uh, how well police officers are trained, it seems to me, and the report speaks to this, that it, there can be national oversight, but it has to be informed by local reality. In other words, you have to have a loose oversight that really empowers localities to really emerge in that way. Maybe it's citizen review boards. Made a, it, it can be done. I yes, mean, we've, absolutely. we've called for a national you know, oversight. And, and, and in fact, as you alluded to previous task forces that were convened, they've called for the same thing. Yes. So it's not as if this is, this is, not, this is a, not a novel concept 
uh, I think many of us agree that there needs to be mm -hmm. this national oversight. Now, right now, what we're doing is we're just kind of doing this ad hoc type of oversight. We've got various entities within the Department of Justice. Uh, you've got the administration in, in its own capacities. Um, you've got entities, obviously, within Homeland Security. Everybody's exercising their various different levels of oversight, whether it be through uh, dealing with the you know, local law enforcement in the, in the distribution of grants uh, through COPS program and through um, the burn uh, jab, you know, uh, uh, grants that are given to police to police forces, or through Homeland Security, they're dealing with immigration, um, you know, and w with uh, dealing with oversight and dealing with um, uh, uh, enforcement of the immigration laws. And so you've got a lot of different oversight that is happening there as well. I think that we've we just had uh, the release of the um, guidance uh, for uh, federal agencies on the use of race, so racial profiling guidance that was released. But unfortunately, it only covers federal agencies, and it does not, in it, specific federal agencies, it does not, within the Department of Justice jurisdiction, it does not cover Homeland Security. So you're not covering a lot of the ICE agents that are out there and um, engaging in enforcement uh, dealing with immigrants, or the, uh, you know, which is a huge issue but we're, you know, that we have a, a different overlap because we, now we're getting beyond just African Americans. We're dealing with people of color generally. Sure. And so you have that guidance that's been released. You have, as I said, other agencies that are distribu distributing get grants, and so they have different levels of oversight and accountability that they're engaged in, but it's ad hoc. And so we need that overall effort. But and I think that that can be done, but it has to be, I think this is a start, but we've got to actually force that creation of that, that type of oversight committee. That's a structural problem, again, that's political. You, you, I agree. You, you, will never, I totally agree. you will never get that because you'll be infringing constitutionally on the state's rights to do I, most I, of these I hope things. It's political. And, 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 I hope it's political. And, in that. and the other part of it, that the, uh, the, the, the report touched on it briefly, but they didn't go into great detail. The education in, in this country about how police operate and why we do what we do and how we do it, it's, it's unfortunately mostly done through TV and bad TV at that. So people get a lot of misinformation about what is going on in policing. Or you experience get, for those who have contact with the police. Some people. I think, yeah. most, I think most people's interaction with the police, because there are millions and millions of interactions with police officers on a daily basis, the only time we talk about them is if something goes horribly wrong. I don't disagree, but so, I'm saying so, we, we, so the vast majority of police officers are doing a very good job given what we ask them to do and how we train them. But at, in terms of education, mm -hmm. in terms of education, both sides uh, of, the, of the coin need some additional education because most people don't understand what the police officers are doing. They don't have any idea why they do some of the stuff they do. And all we, you, you get overwhelmed with the in the reporting when it's a bad situation where someone is killed or where a police officer is accused of some type of misconduct. And that's just the nature of the way things operate. But even the incidents that wouldn't be reported. I mean, you know, the, the idea that uh, for many people in this society, I mean, you know, we talk about the talk, so to speak, uh, that black men have with their sons. But I would say black, black women, women have, have with, with their, their girls. Sons. I got two sons. That's that exactly right. <laughs> or with their daughters. Everybody should have that talk well, about interacting but, but with police talk, officers. It's not just limited to, I don't disagree. to, to, to black, but white, brown. It, well, in, that, in, this, in this respect, I think it, it, it is circumscribed by the people of color who are not white, because white's a color too. Correct. But uh, the idea that your job, when you have an encounter with the police, is to survive. That's, that's, what, that's what a lot of young people, non-whites, hear. Your job is to survive. That's certainly what I was told. And when you, when you get stopped, your job is to survive. Now, in, in terms of police training, I don't think it's unusual for people to be aware of the fact that a police officer's job in a moment of encounter is to control the situation, right? Whether it be control it through use of language, through body language, through procedure, but ultimately to control that situation. Correct. Let me say, yeah. in, from touching upon that there, I'm also a member of the National Bar Association, mm -hmm. and the National Bar has been engaged in trainings and town halls. Oh, absolutely! Working with um, you know youth across the country and having these Dunn to teach them how to interact and engage with law enforcement. And you're exactly right. The main um, the the main message is you need to survive. No, get, I think no, no, I'm, no, let me no, just no. let me okay. just speak. Let me tell right. you. She's right. Let me just tell you. The main message is that you need to survive that encounter, and we will deal afterwards, 24 hours later, 
with whether or not what happened to you was legal, whether or not due process was followed, and we can deal with that after the fact. But we do not want you to have an engagement in which we end up having to deal with another Michael Brown or another Tamir Rice because we can't do anything after that fact. Right. You're dead. And so that is unfortunately the message that many feel has to be given right now. And whether or not you agree that, the, you know, that, that whether or not um, we are talking about all, we're, we're obviously not talking about all law, law enforcement, but unfortunately there are those in, in interactions that many youth of color are engaged in, in which this is the main message that they have to hear because otherwise there's going to be an interaction that is going to erupt in a situation in which they feel they're not going to see the tomorrow and to deal with whether or not due process was followed. And, and that's, that's good advice for everybody, not just uh, people of color. In, in, we keep referencing Michael Brown. Michael Brown attacked that policeman. The Justice Department investigated it. The state investigated it. You can, you can sn no, snicker. No, 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 I'm not snickering the, the fact because let's, the, just the, say, let's just say he was in the absolute wrong. What has that got to do with what you just heard? The, because the action of the person on the scene dictates the reaction of the police officer yes, to you. Yes, but Tamir Rice is 12 years old, was killed within the span of four seconds after being, you know, be, because he had a, a um, you know, a play, you know, gun. Now, the police we, officer didn't know I that. I understand that the police officer may have police thought they didn't home, know, man. but let's just be clear about the training that was engaged in that as in incident. Whether or not there, that police officer, from my understanding, also did not listen to the caller to the police, you know, um, the 911 dispatch dispatcher did not put out that the information the that she received that this may be a toy to the officer in the field. So the officer in the field arriving, thinking he's coming to a man with a gun, okay. not that the gun may have okay. been a toy. And what so, about, so John, and, but John what you Crawford, just said, a man with John a gun, a wall. man with a gun, and this is this man with a gun, 12 years old, and this is why, how we get back again to survival. That you can't survive when you have automatic bias that you as a young child is going to be presumed to be a threat an adult threat mm -hmm. to that police officer regardless of how old you are regardless of what the reality is and so the fact of the matter is that you're right we all have to have different conversations but youth of color people of color unfortunately have we, we have to have that conversation with our young children particularly if they're tall I've got a tall five-year-old who looks like he's a seven or eight-year-old right now and I understand that I'm going to have to have a conversation with him probably in a year or so because he's going to be looking like he's a teenager walking he around. Kindergarten yet, he's kindergarten right now. Well, the reason I ask you that because one of the recommendations, right, the oh, is talking he, about the surveillance in the school. Well, that's already he, happened. He may already so my be point so is, is that we, you know, this is the engagement that we're dealing with. This is the reality. And so I, I respect the fact that we are wanting to um, ensure that we have, that, that, that many, the majority of police officers are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to do their job and actually protect and serve. But we also are still dealing with the reality that those that are particularly, if we look at the, the, the DOJ's um, um, report in Ferguson, you had, not, I think it was 87 or 95 percent of the incident, uh, you know, use of force was against African Americans. All the uses of force by attack dogs was against African Americans. That you had 87% of those incidents that are, you know, police, you know, engagements or shootings against African Americans, yet they're only 67% of the population. And so and that's the reality also, that we're dealing there's, with. There's, there's a sort of but another we also component. are 13% of the population and we're involved in 57% of the homicides in this country. So if you want to throw numbers around, what about those numbers? The fact of the matter is, the political structure in Ferguson the people who had the power to change what was going on at the Ferguson City Council and the Ferguson City Hall didn't use it. And whether or not, I'm sorry, whether or not the, there was, the police, the, the, the DOJ report says there was bias. If you're 67% of the population and you get cited for 87% of whatever the issue is, statistically, because you're such a large part of the population, I don't see that as an outlier, but what, that's just me. What about 16,000 people in Ferguson and 21,000 open warrants? I mean, that, 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 okay, <laughs> just a on. moment. I'll answer your question. Yes, please. That is, that is a structural political problem. The police officers didn't set, did, did not set up that court system that allows for individuals to have warrants if they don't pay citations. So the, so the mandate is stop.
stop this, somebody for jaywalking. No, no, that's not the mandate. The mandate is if you get in, in the structure that they had, mm -hmm. and the, the District of Columbia used to have a similar structure, and we, we moved to an administrative process for tickets. We don't cite people other than criminal traffic matters. You, you're not going to criminal court. So mm -hmm. if you run a red light or you have a seatbelt ticket, it's all administrative. Mm -hmm. Apparently in Ferguson it was not, and if you didn't pay that ticket, it turns into a warrant. Sure. How is the police responsible for that? They didn't establish no, and, that and structure. The DOJ report didn't say that it, that was a police issue. They said that was a municipal court right. issue. Right. That entire system the criminal system was, system. It was, right. system was set up but in order to benefit on the backs of police that caught that their, brunt of their, everything their, their budget. Wrong. I think their, it's their yearly budget. But it's was all. On stopping sure. right. I mean, it was all. It's a debtor's yeah. prison that was created in Ferguson that's right. that we're and dealing with. That's why quotas are bad, and that's why quotas are illegal. because it gives the wrong incentive for enforcement action. But again, we go to what. What created that structure? Sure. The police department didn't do it. We're, the the we're political leadership in, in, in Ferguson did we're that. Not how, how prevalent is that structure of sort of, of small cities or municipalities relying on fines generated by stopping Large people? Large cities, police. small cities. So, I mean, the, the meters in this city, Washington, D.C., are a different price depending on different places where you are in the city. And, I and mean, I so think, absolutely. But I think what's really at the root of your question is that we don't have that information to know. I mean, the only reason we know what happened right. in Ferguson is because there is an investigation that was conducted by the Department of Justice after a killing of an unarmed black man. We don't have those investigations happening across the country. Um, and so, and right now, uh, getting back to the fact that we don't have the data that comes in because we don't have a uniform methodology of collecting that information, we don't have that tool right mm. now, we're not going to know that information. And so that's another recommendation we're calling. Like we need that information but so that, that we can figure it out. The uniformity that you're talking about in, in reporting, if, for example, if you look at the FBI's UCR, the Uniform Crime Reporting System that they have. Well, it's not just uniformity. But it's it, actually a requirement. But, you know, it's not voluntary it's, right it's, now. It's voluntary. The only way yeah. you get compliance, and, and look at what happened with the ACA. Okay? Again, this is political. Look mm -hmm. at what happened with the ACA. Mm -hmm. You tell me that. Uh, for, let's say, a Democratic president in Congress en enacts requirements that you report, and a state says, well, I don't want to because I disagree with you politically. It becomes a political football, and none of that information gets put forward. Everybody un uh, agrees that we need to collect as much data as possible to make sure that we're making the right decisions about what direction to move in. The issue is going to be, how do you gain compliance? Now, in, in, that's right. in And that's for why I talk about incentivizing a lot of the grants that are going to the agencies in order to incentivize that. But if, to if make, it's a five-man police department or a ten-man police department that's not receiving any federal grants, how do you get that data? Uh, you're right. Well, I mean, I think we've got to we've got to have a, a a real discussion about how it is you require that information to be sent. You know, that's right. to that's be right. provided. And, and as a matter of public policy, I think that we really do have to see a level of social engagement, civic engagement particularly in terms of electoral politics, that pushes this envelope. Um, and the reason I say that is because one of the things that the report talks about is engaging in more partnerships with uh, private capital, private industry. I'm a little wary of that. I mean, it's on the front page of today's New York Times, uh, there's a county in California that just was just asked to spend half a million dollars on this stingray surveillance stuff for cell phones. And the, it, it, one of the things that they have to be cleared from, cleared by, is a private Capital is, is the company that makes this thing. Now, this is, this, is, this is surveillance technology where they can list. They say, well, we're just listed to the cell phones of those who we're trying to pick up. But the, but the equipment serves as a cell phone tower. They are picking up everything. So I guess what I'm saying is that the only way that you intervene in, in issues like that or issues like this is that have the people have to intervene. It, Electoral politics, but it's pushed, as you said, finally, it's pushed by protest. Because we wouldn't be well, sitting here had not those people gotten the streets. And I, and I want to get back to that issue that you've also raised um, about the political power yeah. that needs to be exercised. Yeah. I agree. We could, I think that many of us who were assessing the situation in Ferguson and many other areas agree that was one of the first things to come to light, that there has not been that engagement in the democratic process so that you've created this structure in which you do have those that are in authority that don't look anything like the community, do not have an interest in the community, and therefore are, you know, you know and, and so that is the, cre the, the structure. However, hmm. that being said, while I totally agree that we need to correct that process, that does not justify and eliminate the responsibility of those in authority to act justly. That's right. Okay, so That's right. I agree 
that we've got to deal with a lack of political power, but that does not justify and excuse those that are currently in power from engaging in this discriminatory behavior that they engaged in throughout the years in Ferguson. So I don't want to excuse that behavior well, while I at the same time saying we need to take responsibility for the actions that we're not, that people are not exercising, can for I, example, going to vote. Can I ask you as a lawyer, because I mean, I teach a class at Harvard Law School and we go through every major dimension of the law and the way that the law has attempted to address that in this country. How do you imagine the law intervening in these spaces, particularly when you look at the intent standard, for example. I mean, what happened in Ferguson, or what happened in Florida, or what happened in any of these cases that we're talking about, Tamir Rice, John Crawford, mm -hmm. you know, can the Department of Justice do much more than what oh, it did no, in the case they of- They actually what? need to change. I mean, even Attorney General Holder has, has noted that there actually needs to be, he thinks there needs to be, or we need to revisit the, what, what, what could the they standard. Do? We need to change the <laughs> standard that, by which but, but that's baked into, it's not, and, and it's not just I mean, baked into the Civil Rights Act of 64, yeah. it's really the courts. Because, I mean, it's almost like the courts inverted or, or raised that standard, elevated that standard. That intent burden that you see coming out of the Civil Rights Act of 19, uh, 1866, the stuff they used in U.S. versus Price, you know, the so-called Mississippi Burnings case. I mean, in the egregious examples, the court finds the courage somehow to say, these police need to go to jail because what they did was in fact state action. But in case after case, when people say, we're gonna get justice, we're gonna get justice, I know as a lawyer, you must sit there and say, my God, I wish these people understood that that intent burden has been raised so high that they're not going it's to get an evolution throughout the court system throughout the years. And you, I think that we're not, I, I think we, I'll say that many of us that were watching this and knew that the Department of Justice was conducting these investigations, we were, un, we were saddened but not surprised. not surprised. Okay, so I think we had much more belief that there should be what happened with the investigation over the pattern and practices yes. of the department. But with regard to the claims, uh, the federal civil rights claims against uh, Officer Darren Wilson, I think we all knew. We all knew that there was a high standard, there was a high burden, and that that, you know, it was likely it was not going to be I think that's how it should be when you ask someone to go out here and make a decision in a split second that you have the luxury to sit back and dissect for 10 years while they're facing danger. That is why that standard is high. And, I, and if we start tinkering with that standard, simply because we don't like the outcome in this one case, who are you going to get to do these, that, these very just, difficult that's jobs? Just, that's, just not, that's just not true in, in terms of the history of American jurisprudence. That standard is high because the lives that have been most subject to that threat have not counted in this country. But, that, but that's a separate case. I would agree with you in this. I would say this. Police in this country are like teachers. We know we value in this country by what we spend money on. We know how, what we value in this country by how we help people achieve a standard of excellence. This country is <coughs> never going to move beyond its, its <coughs> slow disintegration into this deeply structurally unequal kind of capitalist state. It's never going to move beyond that until it makes different kinds of investments. The Police officers should be well trained. They should be well educated. They should be well compensated. Teachers the same way. <coughs> but what you see is there's no deep structural commitment to the civic polity. That's what we're talking about. Well, but, but let me let me just say just so we have a chance for uh, questions. Um, no, you guys, each a good this is a great, oh, this is a great yeah. conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but, but so that we can have uh, let the audience sort of weigh in with uh, with their questions. If you guys each want to sort of respond to sure. that, and okay. uh, we can. Sure. Oh, no go ahead. Uh, it's. I, I don't disagree with you in terms of the the training. The history you can't. The history is history. Yeah. It, it, it's there. We we know that structurally America was the three fifths compromise racist to give power to the southern states in the Congress. It was done that way for a reason. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is in terms of training, professionalism, and all the things that people talk about they want the police to do, when it comes down to the actual pocketbook issue of paying for that kind of service, mm -hmm. we balk. Right. Okay? We, I, I agree I with you. We, with we, you. We, we balk at that. So if you want police officers to have the high level of training that everybody, I believe, <coughs> wants, you know, uh, five, three, four years of professional development, and the types of things we do with attorneys, we have to pay for it. It's not impossible. I think we all agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but we yes. all have to pay, yeah. we, we have to yes. pay for that. I think we're and right. when you have municipalities, Washington DC, the only jurisdiction over the, during the recession who grew its budget, didn't pay its police officers, give them a raise for eight years. Mm -hmm. So now you have all these people wanting to leave and they can't recruit and replace those people fast uh -huh. enough. Let me just so ask you, where will they go? 
because I'm assuming many of these folks who retire will be much be young enough to start a whole second career. They gonna go into private security. Many no, of them. No, um, there are different tiers of retirement system for us. There are okay. three actual tiers. So the middle tier, which is the one I belong to, you have mm -hmm. to be at minimum of 50 years old and serve uh, uh, 25 years of service to be able to years plus time. Years plus time. Uh -huh. So I mean, the reason I raised that is because let's just say, and I know. Let's just say you started police officers at $100,000 a year. What kind of recruits would you get? You'd probably get very good ones, but your problem there will be it's not necessarily sustainable. I mean, over well, I as, mean, as inflation. The, the country certainly has the money. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're both laughing because we know it doesn't have the political just will. That's where we want to spend right. that. Exactly. exactly. Okay, I'm questions. sorry, we have questions. <laughs> Two little facts and a question here. One, you know, I, I welcome the, the reform talk, but we should all know that we are safer now than we've been since the late 60s, early 70s in terms of crime stats, just as throwing that out there. And two, how does any of this uh, discussion kind of <coughs> relate to some of the underlying issues that we have with youth violence? I mean, the second leading cause of, um, of death among youth 14 to 25 is homicide. And the number one leading cause for African-American youth 14 to 25 is homicide. And, and what we know about the stats is that Folks are killing themselves within races. So how does any of this reform actually address these underlying issues? Because it doesn't seem like it does. Well, I mean, the report opens with, and then very quickly moves past it, the fact that we're dealing with the question of the economy. We're dealing with the question of education. These are structural issues, as we say. I mean, the police, right, the police are catching the brunt of it at this moment because they're the point of contact. But you, and you're right, I mean, violence is intimate. You know, Rudolph Giuliani may talk about black on black violence. Perhaps he needs to talk about intimate violence because white on white violence is the same type of violence. But the, 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 the question you're raising is the question that the report evokes and then remains mute on, which is the structural problem of the economy. If, if folks have jobs, if folks are making a living wage, if folks are building community, folks are much less likely to stick a pistol or a fist or a knife in somebody else's face. The question, to your question, why is there, there this persistent uh, underclass or underperformance in the black community. We know there are historical reasons for it. But in my view, there is a perspective problem here. It's how we teach people in poor communities to view what the United States represents as an idea. So if you take a look at immigrants, and I am one, I came here from Jamaica in 1974, the view of the United States is that this is a place of opportunity. I, you can come from dirt poor beginnings. And if you get here and you do the right things and you work, you can achieve whatever you want. But persistently, we tell people in uh, depressed communities in the United States that the system is so stacked against them that they will never succeed. That mindset gets ingrained. And then they don't succeed. Well, if you've been telling me my entire life that I'm the victim of something, and in some cases, in a lot of cases, they are. But if that's all I tell you is that the system is stacked against you, you can never get ahead, you can never succeed, how are you going to succeed? That's a very good question. I mean, you know, John Ogbu, even Oliver Cox in the, in the 40s, we talk about the difference between a caste minority and an immigrant minority. And one of the things that we have in this country is that people of African descent in particular, but as you say, immigrants who come from other places uh, are not looking to this country for their cultural grounding. What you have in this country is a group of people who are a caste minority. And so that type of, and, and by the way, that's about to change. Because one of the things the report evokes is that we're moving into a plural America. Many of these things may change as the demographics change. Because you can't continue to keep that type of message going in a society where whites will become just one more minority. So I, I completely agree with everything was just said here. But um, I also want to take issue with your statement that currently, you know, that today we are as you said, the most, the safest oh, in this right. country that we ever have been. And I guess that depends, since this, okay, well, I think that is all in relative yeah. terms. I think it depends on who you're talking to. Because we have right now one in every four black men who are in jail and are incarcerated right now. We have a problem of over-incarceration in this country. So if you want to use that and say that therefore, because one in four black men are incarcerated, therefore we are the safest in this country since the 1960s, mm -hmm. then have at it. But I don't think that you would get that same reaction and that same statement from any African American who, has, who is aware and knows within their community what is happening and what exists today. So, you know, we are in a, we are in a, a, a state 
right now in which we're dealing with the new Jim Crow, as Michelle Alexander would say. That is our criminal justice system. So it has been, it ha there is a system that has been put in place essentially to over-incarcerate. I have to take and so with that. that I, I mean, the, I, new, I, the new I, Jim Crow, really? In, yes, you think, no, there just is a no second. New Jim Crow. In, in, in 2014, Jim I mean, Jim Crow was neither one of us could walk in certain parts of the United States, use certain facilities, and legally the police could come in, bash us over the head, and take us out. I think we have to be careful when we start comparing what goes on in a courtroom in the United States in 2015 to Jim Crow in 1915. We, I think I, John Crawford was in a Walmart and lost his life. Yes, he was and holding what looked my, like... My quibble with Professor Alexander is there is no new Jim Crow. Jim Crow has continued in terms of structural inequality and in terms of legal, uh, the legal kind of reinforcement. No, yeah. those laws are not on the books anymore, right. except, except that 50 years after the Voting Rights Act, John Roberts and the majority of the Supreme Court kicked the teeth out of Section 4 by saying that this thing has changed. When in fact, Ruth Ginsburg in dissent said, here's case after case after cases when it didn't. Oh, Jim Crow had to disappear. <laughs> I'm a student at American University, I'm a junior, and I think the one thing that the panel has uh, agreed on is historical context and education and also educating police. But um, at my university right now, we're struggling with a lot of um, racist opinions and thoughts at our school by students that go to our school and who can graduate from American University with racist opinions and views and with no understanding of historical context. So my question is, do you guys believe that we should tackle the issue of implicit biases and also not knowing historical context by like forcing universities to actually require this kind of education? Because even if um, police officers are educated through the best universities, uh, in America and graduate with a bachelor's or even a master's, they may never have to understand racial institutions or privilege, et cetera, et cetera, and still become police officers and not even understand how their implicit biases are affecting certain communities. Yes, you, you answered your question by asking, <laughs> yes, but I think in addition to that, uh, we years ago, uh, 2007, we wrote the curriculum for the first mandatory uh, African-American history course in the Philadelphia Public Schools. It has to be K-12 as well. Mm -hmm. It has to be start in kindergarten, come all the way up through 12th grade, and there shouldn't be a university in this country, public or private, that does not require its students to do exactly that. But so, I, yeah. think, I think a part of the problem is as we, it's all American history. I was just going to say, it's, 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 it shouldn't just it's, be well, African-American. It's, 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 it's all certainly be, black movements in America. I don't know and, about American and, history. And, and what happens is when we, we, we had to start off with just black history to get the attention and say, listen, it's American history, it's important history. You, I don't know if you're ever going to get people to give up their views because one of the beauties of this country is you can engage in racist behavior, you can have hate speech, and it's America, you have a right to say it. Now, it's becoming increasingly difficult for you to function in the broader society with overtly racial uh, biases that you, you speak about, that you write about. Uh, so a lot of it is, is, is covert. So you, you have to give people the right to be bigots if they want to be. And the, as the larger society moves forward, this generation of children that have been so interactive, yes, we still have some pockets where it's just either all black or all white, but for the, a lot of the children, uh, th they don't view things the way, I, I'm 51, they don't view them the way I view them. And I'm, I'm certain in 10 years, they won't view things the way some of the children that were born 20 years ago view them. I think we, as a society, we are evolving. We're becoming more inclusive. Uh, you know, when I, when I spoke at Brookings, one of the things that uh, people said, N nothing's changed. And I invoke Congressman John Lewis, who on 60 Minutes about a month ago said, there are all these people saying nothing's changed. Well, you send them to me and have them walk in my shoes, and I'll show them how it's changed. With all due respect uh, to Congressman Lewis, the, Lewis the, uh, the schools, the public schools in his home state, are more segregated now than they were when he was going, as, well, they were as justice as segregated now as they were when he was going through the civil rights struggle 50 years ago. But With all have, due respect to his sacrifice. Have, but things, things have, have changed. Things it, have changed and they've gone back. And so exactly. I think that that's what we just have to acknowledge, that there has been change. I'm not going to deny that there hasn't been progress in many areas. Unfortunately, there's also been negative, pro you know, there, that we have gone backwards on right. a lot of other 
you know, manners as well. So for example, in education, we are resegregated in many, in many right. states. We are at, at the point, the same type of segregation that we were facing back in 1954 when we were dealing with Brown v. Board. So right. I, I, would, I, I like your point about the fact that this is American history. That we, you know, I, I believe that we're, we need to look at also, and I, I wanted to ask your, your opinion about this, that the textbooks that, uh, we're, that st students are, are learning from these days, you need to get to that deep, that level of right. engagement because you have companies that are determining, you know, by their own belief systems, what it is that's being put into our children's textbooks. But we also have people that want right. to sanitize. But I'm just saying that this is a sanitize historical works, like when they wanted to take the the N word out of Huckleberry Finn. How can you read that uh, that it work? It is what it is. It's Tom Sawyer. It's, he, I mean, Tom Sawyer. I'm sorry. How, yeah. how do you how do you take? I, I don't it? think I don't think there will ever be a standardized American narrative. You can't because I don't the, think the market is driven by whoever the biggest buyer is. And, but the, thing, the 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 fact that public dollars are spent. But it's still it, driven by who no, the, no, the not, biggest buyer. I'm not Texas disagreeing, system. but when you're looking at public education, this is what some problems I have with, with, with the president and his race to the top and his secretary of education and this privatization of public education. You know, when you start talking about funneling money for these kind of things, you're really having a challenge. But I, I, I would definitely agree with you, though. And, and education is definitely where we have to, we have to start there. Mr. Burton's view on this, but uh, welcome views from all the panel. Uh, the war on drugs, we talked a little bit about the new term Crow a minute ago. The war on drugs obviously has been criticized uh, for being racially uh, biased in enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, here in D.C., where, you know, that was the primary argument behind decriminalizing and then legalizing marijuana, there's no question, you know, African Americans in D.C. are eight times more likely to be arrested uh, than whites despite almost identical use rates. You know, at the same time, you know, that, that argument has been criticized on the basis that uh, you know, those disparities are attributable to, you know, institutional, uh, you know, policing tactics uh, that need to change, you know, broader police tactics that need to change. So to what extent is drug decriminalization uh, sort of a Band-Aid on a gash that doesn't really address the, the underlying things that need to change? And to what extent is it a legitimate means to combat, um, you know, disparate racially biased enforcement of well, the in law. Well, in, in terms of the, the, the marijuana study that you cite, one of the things that's missing from that study is the location of the arrest. You, you smoke marijuana outside before the decriminalization, and if I could smell it, I can make, I, that's reasonable articulable suspicion for me to come and investigate and, and probably arrest you. The law was changed to remove that. I can't use the odor of burning or unburnt marijuana as reasonable articulable suspicion anymore. So, of course, that in public places, the, I can't use that, so my ability to engage goes down. In terms of um, you know the, the disproportion that they talked about in that study, we also have arrested disproportionately black men for murder, rape, robbery, carjacks, and everything else, and they didn't decriminalize that. So the issue in terms of the war on drugs is that the drug business is an underground, multi-billion-dollar business, mm -hmm. and we need to rethink where we're going to put our resources in this business. And, and I think what's instructive for us in terms of possible solutions is to look at what happened during Prohibition mm -hmm. and the, the criminality that was created by making alcohol illegal. I mean, organized crime was here before, but it became supersized under, under Prohibition. So there are a lot of things we need to look at. And these are conversations that people aren't necessarily comfortable with because they think, oh, you're endorsing drug use. No, I'm not. But what I'm saying is we do have to take a look at the resources that we're putting into that. Now, drugs and illegal businesses of any kind tend to spark violence because the way it's controlled is through the enforcement of the biggest, baddest guy on the block. So sure. we need to take a look at those things. But that's a political decision, not a policing decision. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mike Golash. Uh, in some ways, I think the discussion is a little bit superficial in the sense that we're not really talking about what is the fundamental function of police in our society. And I think the fundamental function is, is to enforce the social relationships that exist in this society, i.e., keep the rich rich and keep the poor poor. That's fundamental to our society. And the police are the agents of carrying out that. So you don't see police going arresting a scab at a factory. You don't see a, a policeman going, a boss fires somebody unjustly. You don't see a policeman going arrest him. A guy steals a loaf of bread, he gets arrested for that. So the whole rules are set up to protect the well-to-do 
at the expense of working people. And the police often buy into that outlook, and they become very arrogant. Like I drove a bus in Washington for 30 years. I can never remember one time when a policeman parked in a bus stop would move his car so people could get off the bus. I never had happened. He felt he was entitled to park there. That was his right as a policeman. You go into the, the little carryout at Georgia, New Hampshire. Every morning, the policemen come in. I'm, I'm entitled to a free cup of coffee, me and my friend or my, they would get their free cup of coffee and walk out. You know, so you see this day in and day out. The police feel, hey, we are above the law. We make our own rules. And yeah, once in a while, unfortunately, a person gets killed, but I don't really care too much about that because I understand I'm doing my job protecting the well-to-do and terrorizing working people. And I think until we have that type of discussion and understand what the police are all about, we're just really talking about training our, you know, training a police force to better keep us down, to make it less, less transparent what their real function in society is. And uh, so I basically, you know, I've ne I don't think there's any such thing as a good policeman, to tell you the truth, because most of them, or 99% of them, buy in to that outlook. Mike, I, I would say this. I would say, in fact, when I asked what did the police do wrong, that's really what I was alluding to. The police are there to maintain order. The police are there to maintain the social relations. And yes, the most vulnerable will be the, those who have the most contact with police. So that's why the reality was, yes, crime, may, we may have the lowest crime since the 1960s, but if you ask the most vulnerable, they would laugh at that assertion. But, but, but to, to your point, I think, and I was re in reading, rereading the report and thinking about this, looking in vain, not even hoping, not expecting to see anything different, what you don't see is what you just addressed. Well, this is a question of, you know, you know, the friendly cop who works with the uh, Fraternal Order of Police and helps a kid get out. Oh, yeah, that's nice. But let's be very clear. You are going to jail for these petty crimes. And ultimately, as Gil Scott Heron once said, those who try to steal the country never go to jail. Number one, it's not a petty crime if it's your property that they take. OK, let's let's be real. If that loaf of bread is would, your would, loaf of bread, let me would, finish. Would that finish. include the, the, the value if, of my home if, when it's theft if, by major mortgage companies? If, let's deal with what you raised and answer the question. That's not asked. petty theft. That's if, grand theft, if, brother. If you steal that loaf of bread from that, that shopkeeper and you call the police, you're going to be arrested. As a historical fact, you are incorrect. They used to call the police in to break up strikes. That's why when hmm. the FOP was formed, they had to form it as a fraternal organization because we, it was illegal for police officers to be in unions. Mm -hmm. So I reject your premise that we are there to keep the rich rich and to oppress the poor. You know, most policemen are, are not living in a lap of luxury, I, I need to let you know. And you probably made more money working, uh, driving a bus around town than most of the cops that you seem to have a, ver a disdain for. The fact of the matter is, sir, if the police don't come to work, you wouldn't be able to drive your bus down the street. Because you know what will happen? Then the law of the jungle kicks in. Oh. Uh, just a minute. Just a minute. Let, let me make that. my point. Let me, let me make the point. You really believe Look at what happened in New Orleans during Katrina. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on now. Look, so no, I mean, it broke down. It broke down no, because there was no one there. No, like, that, well, that wasn't about no, order. Just, that was about no people let me being. That's my point. Okay. Well, wow. Let me just jump in for a second. Uh, you can. Wow. Make those as sort of final thoughts. I'm getting a signal that I think we've got to we've got to make it. It's been a very great and very lively discussion. Okay. But if everyone can, Gosh, I'm glad you made I, that point about New York and when the slowdown came, how the crime rate didn't go up. I think that everybody, like a lot of folks, and let me stop saying everybody. There's no absolute. Like to point the finger at the police, at the, that the police are the boogeyman, the police are the bad guys. The fact of the matter, the, the opposite is absolutely true. The vast majority of police officers, and I don't make excuse for misconduct. There is no excuse for misconduct because you. Our job is to protect and serve the people who pay our salaries. I don't pay my own salary, taxpayers do. And it is a very, very tough position to be in because every time a mistake is made, whether it's a willful, uh, if a mistake is made, you're gonna get judged harshly. If people believe that that mistake is willful, you get judged more harshly. And then when the results of what they believe is some type of criminal action on the part of the police, when, when it's looked at by a grand jury and no action's taken, it's like they get away with everything. I, I'm here to tell you, no, we don't get away with everything. Mm -hmm. It's like you said, it's, it's very difficult to, to prosecute a police officer and I think uh, officers and I think the system is, is structured that way. The intent requirement is there because the, 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 uh, there has to be intent to do that harm. It can't just be because the police officer made a mistake. 
You know, so the conversation, the, the, the honest conversation about what we do and, and, and how we do it and, and why we do it mm. and the mistakes that we make. Do you think that the uh, prosecution happen. of the transit cop in the Akai Gurley case in, in, in Brooklyn is a, is, a, is a good prosecution? Because clearly the DA there was able to indict. In that particular circumstance, tragic as that, as that circumstance is, the, the issue is going to be, um, and I, I, I rarely want to talk about active cases that are sure, still in sure, the courts. No, I, I mean, well, to the degree you can't. I mean, the because I'm thinking about the intent standard there. I mean, I'm there, sure there was no intent. intent. There right. was no intent to do anything to anybody in right. that. In that, that that is, you know, no, normally that we we classify discharge in a couple of ways. When a, a weapon fires, you either intended to do it, mm -hmm. or is negligence on the part because generally your finger's not supposed uh, to be on the trigger unless you intend to pull it and shoot at someone. Mm -hmm. That's why you see police officers walking around with their fingers outside the trigger. I was in the Marines for 20 years, they taught sure. the same thing. Sure. So that, that is a tragic case um, where that, that weapon discharged, I'm sure it wasn't his intent to do it. Right. And, and but yet, and eventually, he's but being, he's being tried. He's, he's been charged and we'll see what happens in that case. Political prosecution, you think? Well, look at what happened prior to his indictment. What do you think? Well, I think that anybody can be indicted. That's what I think. Okay. It's all politics, well, which means the intent standard is political as well. Well, I think that um, obviously there's, there's still more to discuss. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, I think one of the major premises of this conversation today was to talk about whether or not these recommendations for the task force could be useful, and I and I still I still believe they can be. I think that this whole conversation sparked was sparked by the fact that we were dealing with a report that came about as a result of the killing of an unarmed black man, and so we've got to take that and utilize what we've got right now. And I think that we need to continue to have this conversation to create a structure that will and that will that will create some long term systemic change because I think as we all agree. We have a structure that is not facilitating uh, justice for a large part of our communities. And whether or not we agree on whether or not that is simply a political problem, or if that's a policing issue, or whether or not that is in the, it's because of the bias that exists within the different structures and individuals, uh, individuals in their society, the fact of the matter is that we have continued killings of unarmed people of color, regardless of who's creating that. So we need to fix it, and this needs to be dealt with, and we need to create, figure out how it is that we can engage in creating, you know, enacting and effectuating not only these recommendations, but dealing with that longer term systemic change so that we can act, so we won't have to continue to come, uh, you know, come here and have this conversation about why it is we're still having these problems within either our policing force, within the, the training within our political structure or, or you know, whatever it is we're talking about. So I'm looking forward to not having to have this conversation mm -hmm. again. Um, but I do appreciate the conversation and hope that we can continue to engage and figure out how we can and actually you know, enact some of these best practices that we spoke about that maybe get more of these model practices so that we can actually have a, a, a fair and I think a just system. Well, Thank you all for uh, the enlightening and edifying conversation. It was interesting sort of to have uh, you know, diverse set of viewpoints up here. And obviously, we covered a, a lot of ground. And thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.